our topic of discussion today now is we are now getting into the mainstream of communication theory and the first thing that we like to understand is some basics about analog signal transmission right um, and I'll, to keep this discussion simple <coughs> we will uh, use a baseband model we look at the baseband signal propagation or transmission through a communication channel. Now suppose we look at the block diagram of a baseband communication signal transmission system as we know we must have a transmitter and the transmitter has uh, this block has everything in it that is required. The input to this is the message signal m of t I will denote the message signal most of the time by the notation m sub t m of t output is output of the transmission transmitter is a waveform or a signal x of t which typically uh, in the baseband context would be a suitably scaled version of m of t right appropriately amplified so as to drive the communication channel nicely. The channel here in general can be modeled by two parts a part which which embodies the effect of distortion that it might introduce right and that part can be modeled conveniently as some kind of a filter some kind of a linear filter what do I mean by that it can modify the amplitude of the various frequency components or it can modify the phase of the various frequency components right all these effects can be nicely modeled if you think of the channel as a filter of some kind. So a very simple and convenient model for a channel communication channel and that is true for every kind of communication channel is to think of this as a filter with some transfer function at sub C f right. So this models the channel. The second part of the channel model will consider the effects like noise we know that noise gets transmitted uh, noise gets added to the signal at various parts various points in the communication system starting from the transmitter going right up to the receiver right all these effects again will be plugged into the channel and therefore the set channel will have a second part which is denoted like this right so this here this block here is essentially an adder which adds to the output of the channel some noise of an appropriate kind which is suitable for use and that is what you receive at the receiver right. So the received signal suppose we were to call it uh, uh, y of t right <coughs> contains effect of transmission this through this channel this filtering that is affected by the channel of some kind and some addition of some noise and the receiver is supposed to work on this input y of t to produce so this is your receiver to, to produce a replica of your transmitted message waveform m sub t m of t together with a small amount of noise which it cannot eliminate. So there is an input noise n of t and the receiver will try to eliminate as much of this noise as possible and also but there may be some residual noise still left which you are denoting by n sub o t. The receiver has to process the incoming wave from y of t so as to remove the distortion that might have been affected by the channel might have been introduced by the channel and also to eliminate as much noise as possible right that is the job of the receiver <coughs> main job of the receiver okay now so this is the model this is a framework in which we have to we will carry out the discussion for today most of today to this class. Now the, our first you see we have been talking about channel introducing two kinds of things one is 
<coughs> this effect, the other is this effect. This essentially carries out what we say distortion, distortion of the signal. This is additive noise, right? This adds on to the signal. So, right, first let us concentrate. In fact, in today's class, let us first discuss only about the distortion part, right? What we like to ideally have is what we call distortion less transmission. And in this discussion, we will ignore the presence of noise, right? Let us assume that noise is not there at all. So, from we will assume n t is equal to 0 because we want to concentrate on what kinds of distortions the channel can introduce and under, <coughs> understand their nature and see whether we can do something about it at the receiver, right? Just to simplify the discussion. Now, in this case, your received signal y of t, which is basically the transmitted signal x t, <coughs> convolved with the filter impulse response h c t, the filter which models the channel, is what you will get as, as y t, right? Now, suppose you forget about the channel for a minute. Suppose you would like this signal here or at the input to the receiver to be a replica of the transmitted signal without distortion, right? That is the ideal thing that you would like to have. Y of t should be a replica of x of t <coughs> without distortion. So what, how, how can we express this relationship in the most general form? What kind of effects we can tolerate and what kind of effects we cannot tolerate? we can tolerate a scaling effect. If the signal gets attenuated, it does not matter. That is not distortion, right? If it simply gets attenuated because I can compensate for attenuation very simply by suitable amplification, right? The other thing that I can tolerate is some delay, that propagation delay. After all, the signal has to physically transmit, physically propagate from one <coughs> point to another point and uh, no matter what is the form in which it propagates, it will take a finite amount of time to do so and therefore there will be some delay. So as long as the received signal differs from the transmitted signal only in terms of a scaling factor and a constant delay, that is acceptable to me as, as a received signal, as a replica of the transmitted signal. Do you agree with that? So ideally speaking, by distortionless transmission, we mean that the received signal y of t is some constant k times x t which is delayed by some amount t sub 0, right? So this is a condition for distortionless transmission. If this happens, if your channel only introduces a scaling factor and a delay, it is an ideal channel, nothing could be better, right? Then channel is a very friendly channel and that is the kind of channel I am looking for physically, right? Now let us look at this effect in the frequency domain. What are we saying therefore, what are the characteristics of the channel for a distortionless transmission? Look at the, what is the, uh, if you if you were to express the same relationship in frequency domain, this would be y of f equal to k times e to the power minus j 2 pi f t naught into x of f. So what are we saying about the transfer function at CF? It is equal to k times e to the power minus j two pi of t naught. So the ideal channel at C at sub CF has a transfer function given by constant k into e to the power minus j two pi f t naught, right? If you were to characterize this ideal channel in the, in, the, in terms of frequency domain plots, then what is the magnitude characteristic we are expecting from this? A constant k for all values of the frequency f, for all frequencies f, right? And what are we expecting 
from it in terms of case characteristics? Anyone? What will be the angle of HCF? What kind of characteristics we are expecting as a function of frequency? The exponent here which is minus j f j 2 pi f t naught as a function of frequency what kind of it is a straight line right with a negative slope right. The angle is 0 at 0 it is positive for positive frequency uh, negative for positive frequencies and positive, uh, positive for negative frequencies right and the sl slope will be equal to minus 2 pi t naught where t naught is a really that that is a slope slope of the straight line right. So basically what are we saying that for signal to be transmitted without distortion the ideal channel would have a flat magnitude transfer characteristics magnitude transfer function and a phase function which is linearly dependent on the frequency right. So that every frequency component present in the signal undergoes the same amount of delay basically what we are saying is every frequency component goes to the same amount of delay and for same amount of delay the phase shift is a linear function of the frequency right required phase shift right. So that is the ideal characteristic of course this kind of an ideal channel is too much to expect to be available in practice right um, it is not even required if you really look upon it because in real terms you will be transmitting a signal of some finite bandwidth not of infinite bandwidth right. So in that case our concept of an ideal channel can be made less stringent in as much as these characteristics hold within the bandwidth of the signal we should be quite happy because what happens outside is of no interest is of academic interest because the signal does not have any frequency components beyond those values beyond some value right. So therefore we can make these conditions less stringent by saying that these conditions should hold within the message bandwidth right. So let us say if the message bandwidth is B right we, we would like that the transfer function magnitude is constant equal to K with between minus P to plus P whether it is constant beyond that is not of any interest to us right it may or may not be because the signal does not have any frequency components there so it would not bother us. Similarly this linear characteristics should hold between minus p to plus p after that if it becomes slightly nonlinear or something else happens to it it is not a straight line after this it does not bother us very much because the signal does not have any trans components in that frequency is that clear. So an ideal channel in a practical situation would be one which has this ki these kinds of characteristics within the message bandwidth at least is that okay good any questions. So we call here uh, we could say then say that the ideal channel transfer function instead of qualifying unconditionally this being equal to minus j2 pi f t0 we will say that this should be so for mod of f less than b that is our condition for distortionless transmission right here t sub 0 denotes the propagation delay and b here is a message bandwidth and k is attenuation constant right. Now this is what the ideal channel is supposed to do real channels unfortunately 
do not in practice even meet these less stringent conditions, right. Even within the bandwidth of interest, the magnitude transfer correct function is not necessarily a constant value, there are variations and the phase characteristics are not necessarily linear, linear functions of frequency, right. So, when that happens, the received signal would or would not be a replica of x of t, it would not be a replica of x of t because it will now go through a convolution of x of t with the impulse response h of t. For the ideal case, what is the impulse response like? The impulse response is, is an impulse function, right. That is why whatever signal you transmit, it gets in the same form to the other receiver, right. Okay, but in this case, it will not be so if these conditions are not satisfied. So, what kind of distortions can be introduced? So, let us discuss types of distortion. Incidentally, these kinds of distortion that I am discussing here, we also refer to them as linear distortion, right. Uh, linear because they are arising from the non ideal characteristics of a linear filter right which is which is being used to model the channel right the ideal characteristics are it should be a linear filter but besides linearity you want the magnitude transfer function should be constant a linear filter may also have magnitude transfer function which is not constant right any filter usually will not have that so, when, when that is not so, then one kind of distortion introduced. If the phase characteristics are not linear with respect to frequency, that leads to another kind of distortion, but both these kinds of distortion are linear distortions because they are arising from non ideal characteristics of a linear filter which is modeling the channel, okay. So, there are two kinds of linear distortion, we are talking about linear distortion here. One is called the amplitude distortion. And this arises when this condition that the magnitude characteristic should be constant is not satisfied over the bandwidth of interest, okay. If the magnitude characteristic of the channel are not constant equal to some value k which is which denotes the attenuation, then we say that over the bandwidth of interest, we say that the channel is introducing amplitude distortion in the sense that the different, different frequency components present in the message waveform MT are being amplified or attenuated differently by the channel. An ideal channel would treat all frequency components in the same way, right, so that to keep their relative magnitudes the same at the receiver, right, but in this case certain frequency components may be attenuated less, certain other frequency components may be attenuated more and this relative difference in treatment in terms of attenuation causes amplitude distortion, right. So, this amplitude distortion does not refer to, does not tell us what kind of effect takes place on the output waveform, right. This is a characterization in the frequency domain, that in the frequency domain the channel does not treat all, all frequency components with the same attenuation characteristics, that is what it means. So, do not think of any other connotation of amplitude distortion other than the one implied in the frequency domain, okay. It does not tell us anything specific about what kind of waveform you might see, right. That should be very clear in your mind. For example, I will uh, give you typical attenuation characteristics that you might see. in the telephone channel for example. Usually these characteristics, magnitude characteristics are plotted on a log scale. So, I am plotting here minus 20 log of HCF. What is it called? Decibels, right. So, you are plotting the amplitude response in decibels. So, the units are decibels. So, 
a typical characteristic that you might see may look something like this, right. So you can see that there is a lot of variation let us call this delta in the uh, amplitude or the at amount, amount of attenuation reference frequency components may go through, right. I am plotting here only for positive frequencies you can replicate for the negative frequency axis. Okay. And for a, so we are, we are going to see characteristics like this which are not flat right which is what you would ideally like to see. As long as this delta is small overall variation is small you can ignore it it does not matter effectively it does not matter very much right. What is the extent to which you can tolerate it when, when this variation is within a dB or so within 1 decibel or so right that is a rule of thumb for you to remember right. So if the variation of the attenuation as a function of frequency let us call that delta is within a dB within 1 decibel the amplitude distortion is negligible and we can ignore it but if it is more than a dB it becomes significant and we have to take that into account. Okay. So that is what amplitude distortion is all about. As against this we have the second kind of linear distortion which we call by the name of phase distortion or sometimes also called delay distortion. These two things typically mean the same thing and as the name implies this kind of distortion arises when your channel has phase transfer function which differs from the required ideal transfer function. What is the required ideal phase transfer function? A linear function of frequency passing through the origin right out function it has to be of course any real filter will have the phase function as an out function that is not a issue. So if it differs from that linear characteristics within the bandwidth of interest we get the phase distortion. So if angle of HF uh, angle of HF is not equal to minus 2 pi T naught F actually it would not matter if it is this plus minus tell me something plus minus how much a multiple of pi is not it if it is a multiple if I if you go back to this equation that we were looking at right if I put a e to the power minus j m pi or e to the power plus j m pi where m is an integer this will be a constant value equal to either plus 1 or minus 1 which can be absorbed in the attenuation factor right. So it does not really make any difference to the basic phase characteristics. So the required condition therefore really speaking is this plus minus m pi right. So if this is so there is no dis over the bandwidth of interest for f mod of f less than b. If this is not so that is it that causes phase distortion or delay distortion right. If this is so what is the amount of delay introduced at frequency f t naught right and it is the same for all frequencies right. If this is not so basically what it implies it implies is that different frequency components undergo different amounts of delay and that is why when they combine together all these frequency components at the other end at the output the signal does not appear to be the same as, as we started with. So if this linear characteristics do not hold it implies different delays for different frequency components.
and that is why we also call it delay distortion right if every frequency component present in the message signal undergoes the same amount of delay there is no delay distortion no phase distortion if different frequency components undergo different amounts of delays there is a delay distortion now fortunately in analog signal transmission like speech right particularly speech delay distortion is not of much consequence reason reason is simple our ear is insensitive to delay distortion right this is, happens to be a property of our perception hearing right but for speech this is an exceptional situation for uh, for pictures for example that's not true right delay distortion matters because the eyes are not insensitive to the way i see uh, see a, a picture it's not insensitive to phase information or delay information uh, and uh, similarly for uh, data delay distortion can can cause havoc i'll repeat that so uh, this is just a practical observation that i'm giving here that delay distortion not very important in speech transmission when when your message signal is basically a speech signal what we are saying is if the message signal happens to be a speech signal and if the channel introduces delay distortion we are not too much worried about it at the reason is uh, because ears are insensitive to this kind of distortion so to understand why that is so of course you have to go into how the ear perceives the signal right we don't have we are not going to go that into, into that right now but that that's just a matter of information for you on the other hand delay distortion becomes um, fatal if it is present when you are doing uh, particular data transmission right so data transmission is highly sensitive to delay distortion similarly for video similarly for pictures it is highly sensitive to delay distortion <coughs> all right so i have repeated what i have said in any kind of pulse transmission right which data transmission is a special case of that delay distortion is going to be fatal right it causes uh, a very severe kind of distortion and if you don't compensate for if you if you don't take that into account in designing your receiver Uh, you will not be able to do a good digital communication right so this these are two kinds of distortion which fall within the domain of what i have mentioned as linear distortion which so whether we have amplitude distortion or phase distortion or both we are talking about linear distortion one important characteristics of linear distortion is that basically the existing frequency components the message signal will get treated differently by the channel either in terms of their attenuation characteristics at different frequencies or in terms of delay characteristics at different frequencies right so that's linear distortion one nice thing about di linear distortion is that at least in theory in concept in concept it is very easy to compensate for it is it it it's obvious what should we do at the receiver put a filter which is a reciprocal of the channel transfer function so in theory it is possible to remove linear distortion through a process called equalization right and that of course will have to be done at the receiver so what we are saying is the message signal goes through a channel with a transfer function hcf so what we must do at the receiver have a filter with transfer function let's say h sub eqf where the product of these two 
together appear as a distortionless channel, right. So, if this is an actual channel and this is your equalizer, what we like to have is that the equalizer should have this kind of transfer characteristic. right so that the product of these two appears like an ideal channel right the product of these two is a net transfer function that the signal will see the message will see that should be equal to k times e to the power minus j 2 pi f t naught prime let us say some other value of propagation delay of course this is required only for mod of f less than the bandwidth. So that the product, the you can think of the product as some kind of an equivalent channel, right? Satisfies the ideal characteristics. So in theory, it is possible to take care of linear distortion perfectly. Of course, things are not as simple as they appear here. In theory is perfectly fine here, but in practice. It, you can imagine there will be a lot of difficulties in actually implementing such an equalizer. Can you think of some difficulties? Hmm? There are two major difficulties that will come up. One is we are assuming that we know what the channel transfer function is like. In reality, you will very rarely know anything about what the channel is doing, right? You are transmitting a message, and what you see at the output of the channel is the received or distorted message you know nothing about the channel. So, unless you do something special unless you make a special effort to learn about the channel characteristics right there is no question of trying to equalize for it. So, that of course means more complication to learn the channel characteristics so that you can implement an equalizer filter which is of this kind is uh, a non trivial effort non trivial job. The second problem that may arise even if you knew the channel transfer function is suppose you knew the trans channel transfer function uh, is due to the fact that we have ignored another very important component which is present in the channel noise right. Suppose the channel HCF has a null over uh, in the range of some frequency components within the pass band within the message bandwidth of interest. Over a, over a few frequencies or in the neighborhood of some frequencies the channel under, uh, exhibits very deep attenuation very large attenuation suppose it happens it can happen right then what will be the required uh, equalizer characteristics at those frequencies very large amplification at those frequencies and if you implement that you can do that what you are also going to do is amplify the corresponding noise part noise components there. So, you may undo the effect of distortion, but you may be introducing or enhancing the effect of noise right which may not be desirable. So, in theory this is all fine, but in practice one has to work out a solution which takes care of these concerns ok. We will not go into further details at this moment this is a subject which is properly uh, dealt with in a course in digital communication. Because we are assuming in this that is a good question the question is the channel can be can we assume the channel to be having a constant transfer function for all time or in other words is it proper to think of the channel as a linear time invariant system the question can be rephrased like this right because I talked about linearity but I did not talk about time invariance it is a good question the answer to this question is yes in some channels no in some other channels. The discussion that we are doing right now is for those channels where it can be modeled as an LTI filter right. There can be channels in which it cannot be modeled as it can be modeled as a linear filter, but not necessarily time invariant right. For example, a wireless channel in which there are lots of reflections from various uh, uh, objects uh, in the propagation path and these objects keep moving or you keep moving right. Obviously, it is a linear characteristic, but it is not time invariant it is linear time varying characteristics. Then of course, our discussion has to uh, this equalization business becomes even more 
difficult because not only you do not know it keeps varying with time right. So how to handle it both theoretically as well as practically becomes a very major issue but these are issues which are beyond the scope of this course at the moment we will not discuss those but at least you know that it can be done and what the concerns are okay any other questions. So that is as far as our discussion on uh, really, uh, linear transfer, linear distortion is concerned. Now I'm, I have been emphasizing this concept I mean this uh, this uh, adjective linear right and that is because we can also have a kind of non-linear distortion. And as the name obviously implies this kind of distortion would arise in a communication system in which in some part of the communication system or the other there is some kind of non-linearity okay. Can you think of any kind of non-linearities which can crop up in a communication system which are the components which can give rise to some non-linearity amplifiers. amplifiers very correctly said particularly power amplifiers. Not the voltage and uh, current amplifiers, but power amplifiers. We've done some course on um, power amplification, some some discussion on power amplification. Class B, class C amplifiers, right? And uh, these are dependent on. Uh, if, if let's say let's take one of these power amplifiers. Whatever knowledge uh, you have is sufficient for our discussion. Under what conditions do they work most efficiently or uh, very well? Hmm? They can they, they are supposed to work very well they work very well if your amplitude of the input signal remains constant right. If the amplitude fluctuates a lot um, first of all they do not work very efficiently but that is not of concern here efficiency is not what is what we are consider, considering here. We are more concerned about the fact that if the amplifier gives different amounts of amplification depending on the amplitude of the input signal it treats the low amplitude signals in some way and the high amplitude signals in some other way then um, we have a kind of nonlinearity. So if you were to typically uh, so let me first mention what nonlinear distortion is so this arises due to nonlinear now this is Please note what I am writing nonlinear transfer, not transfer function, because nonlinear systems I cannot study in terms of transfer functions. I cannot study in the sense, I mean, they, we are not talking about frequency domain here. I am saying due to nonlinear transfer characteristics. What are transfer characteristics of a device like an amplifier? How do we show a transfer characteristics? These are the devices which can exhibit nonlinearity. Amplifiers, mixers, etc. We we still have to talk about mixers. We'll talk about them later. But let's talk about amplifiers. So when I say transfer characteristics of an amplifier, and if you were to plot it, what is the plot that I make? Hmm? I simply plot output versus input. Output y against input x and we are here referring to the amplitude of the output versus the amplitude of the input right. So in fact ignore the ignore the time variable here that is that is of no consequence right. What will be the output input characteristics or transfer characteristics of an ideal amplifier hmm? straight line is not it input is small output should be small correspondingly if the input is large the corresponding output should be large simple nothing beyond that. So it is a constant times the input y of t should be equal to ideally y of t should be equal to some a times x t where a is the amplification factor right that is the transfer characteristics. Now practical power amplifiers will exhibit a kind of nonlinearity which is very commonly encountered call the saturation nonlinearity right 
you know the effect it basically arises because you have some <coughs> finite value of the power supplies and because of this as your input signal becomes larger and larger in amplitude instead of being linear like this you get into this non-linear or saturation mode like this it does not remain linear for all values of the input amplitudes. So as long as your input signal is within the linear range you are fine but if your input signal goes beyond the linear range right then the output is no longer proportional to the input right y of t is no longer a times x t right and that is a non-linearity. Now basically if you were to model this non-linearity you can see that you cannot model it as a straight line a straight line kind of relationship a linear kind of relationship of this kind you have to introduce what can you suggest some some model for this curve that you have here some suitable parametric model for example we can possibly model it as a polynomial of some kind we can find out suitable coefficients of a polynomial such that the resulting curve would look like this this characteristics and that is a usual thing that is done to model nonlinear components nonlinear devices right use polynom polynomial models so a typical model for example for such nonlinear things would be that y of t is a1 times x of t which would have been the ideal thing right but you also have additional terms like a2 times x square t plus a3 times x cube t and so on and so forth and theoretically it is possible to find a set of coefficients a1 a2 a3 etc of with a polynomial of some degree uh, suitable degree such that this resulting characteristics resemble the actual curve that we have plotted right y versus x curve that we have plotted now suppose that is the case suppose let us take very simple suppose we take a very simple nonlinearity of the kind a1 x t plus a2 x square t one thing is clear that the output is not a replica of x t right and therefore there is a distortion right because we would like the output to be simply proportional to x t but we have additional components like x square x cube and so on and so forth right so therefore there is a kind of distortion here now how does this distortion differ from the linear distortion that we discussed in one very very important and very significant way if you remember I had made a comment about when we talked about linear distortion that linear distortion which arises due to non ideal characteristics of the channel in terms of its transfer function can only do something good or something bad relatively to different frequency components that exist in the message signal right. So but it cannot create additional frequency components is not it a linear filter essentially affects whatever frequency components are present in the message signal it will amplify them differently attenuate them differently or uh, delay them differently that is all it can do that is the linear distortion nonlinear distortion on the other hand has the potential to generate frequency components in the output message signal which were not even present in the input signal right and that is the very important way in which nonlinear distortion differs from the linear distortion let me give an example suppose the input signal can is a pure sine wave just for the sake of appreciating this point right pure sine wave of frequency let us say f1 right now what are the components present here this will be a1 cosine 2 pi f1 t plus a2 cosine 2 pi f f2 t whole square cosine square right so cosine square you can write as 1 plus cosine 4 pi f1 t right so now what are the components present in in the in y of t we have f1 and 2 f1 2 f1 was not present the input was containing only f1 right so the input signal contains let us say a frequency component f1 output contains f1 as well as 2 f1 
this is a very simple situation. Suppose now the input signal contains two components F1 and F2, what will you have now? You will obviously have F2, uh, sorry F1, 2 F1 and you will also have F2, 2 F2, in addition you will have F1 plus minus F2, right? You can see that, it is a matter of just writing down the trigonometry and seeing that you will get terms which is cosine of 2 pi into F1 plus F2 times T and 2 pi F1 minus F2 times T. So these additional frequency components that are getting generated is the real problem in nonlinear distortion, right? And that we call these components we call uh, intermodulation components. And this nonlinear distortion is for this reason also called harmonic distortion or intermodulation distortion because different frequency components modulate with each other, modulate each other to produce additional frequency components, right. So uh, therefore another name for nonlinear distortion is another set of names in fact, harmonic distortion because additional frequency components are being present or intermodulation distortion. And that is, is that good or is that bad? It is very bad, right? Why, will, why is it bad? Can you appreciate? Can you suggest? Uh, power is an issue, but it is a less of an issue. It is creating components outside, suppose you have a signal of bandwidth B, your distorted signal will have components much beyond B, right? And obviously you are going to speak into somebody else's band. Suppose you are allotted a certain frequency band to work with, you are transmitting outside that band. Your received signal contains components outside the band. If your receiver was now trying to look, at, look for a signal in that frequency band, it will not only really see that, but will also see some components from this. And this will cause a kind of crosstalk, right. So this will call what is called radio, uh, 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 it is also called co-channel interference. Also, or sometimes also simply called cross talk, right? Yes, please. So does harmonic affect the power of the, uh, the fundamental uh, frequency weight that we are using? Yes, because you can see that these characteristics, this, that will not depend on the value of these coefficients, <coughs> right? So how the power gets divided into different frequency components will depend on the values of these coefficients in the model of the nonlinearity. Right? Any other questions? Sir, the new frequencies which we got, so they can create problem only if they are in the order of the original frequency. Suppose I took F1 and left off in order, and the frequencies are too much high compared to this one. Yeah. They only cause more problems. What you are saying is if F1 and F2, F1 plus F2. It is comparable to F1 or F2 only then I will be having The point is you are not only going to, see you are definitely going to create a distortion for yourself, right? That is obviously happening. So within the frequency band, you have some frequency components and you are having, generating additional frequency components. These additional frequency components may lie within the bandwidth of interest or they may lie outside the bandwidth of interest. They will typically have both kind of situations, right? F1 minus F2 will typically lie within and F1 plus F2 will lie outside, right? So both, both kinds of things are bad. F1 minus F2 creates distortion for us, F1 plus F2 creates distortion for somebody else, crosstalk for somebody else and so on and so forth, right? Okay, we will stop here unless there is some other question. Thank you very much.